At first, there was uncertainty. Then the question became, how bad will this get? As spring rolled into summer 2020, the answer became apparent. It would impact the workforce, the supply chains, the finances, the tenancy, every part of this job. What was gonna happen? Were we gonna be shut down? We started seeing some material issues. COVID really affected our supply chain. The two big ones were the elevators. A lot of the parts were made overseas and then all the appliances. We weren't sure if we were gonna get appliances for the residential apartments. And then there were workforce issues. Scheduling a massive construction project is a complex undertaking, even in the best of times. One trade comes in, does their job, and clears out. Then the next trade comes in. It's carefully orchestrated. But in 2020, that didn't happen. Delays came at critical moments. Two weeks of binge-watching Netflix became known as quarantine. It was probably not at the most opportune times as you're trying to wrap something up where you get your painters or your finishers and all of a sudden, guess what? They're out for 14 days. There were tons of delays because of COVID. You know, like somebody got sick on the millwork team and now they can't get the millwork done. You gotta be nimble and pivot. I mean, it's just that simple. If you can't paint, then you do something else. That attitude kept things moving. As some spaces inched closer to completion, the strings of utility lights were replaced by a different kind of illumination. I think lighting could be one of the most important elements of any project. When lighting is poorly done, it just, it doesn't set the right tone, the right feel. It's the way that lighting can make a place alive or feeling a little tired. It's the color of light that you choose. It's the way the light casts. It's the unexpected elements that lighting can bring. I loved my lighting design. Like, I worked really hard on that. <laughs> and then the bids came in and it was too expensive by a lot. And so it was either we were gonna have to figure out how to make it work with new fixtures or completely lose some of it, which I was kind of worried about. There was a lot of discussions on lighting. We're trying to cut budget. We're trying to still create great impact. That intersection of cost versus impact is where Amy Lawhead makes her living. Her studio, 37 Volts, is located in Cincinnati. After many, many years in the business, I have a lot of different vendor relationships and I'm able to tap into those to assist me to find products and solutions that meet the design criteria and ultimately fall within both the client budget and their design requirements. Joining the team as one of the last team members to come on board was a bit of a challenge and it was figuring out where the design already was and what the team members had already created, being respectful of that design and helping them find the right solutions to reduce cost. She has access to some specialty manufacturers that will create light fixtures that you know are kind of custom but still at a reasonable price. So we were able to cut the lighting package drastically there were things that she showed me that I had never seen before that was really helpful and I'll be able to use that again. Can I help you? And I felt like she was very respectful of my design, which helped. A blueprint or a CAD design shows things like walls, windows, and stairs. But how do you show the effect light will have on the design? Because light has an intangible quality, we don't really know what it does until we turn on a light switch and actually aim or adjust a light. We use software to try to predict what's going to happen. We use different types of software, but in the end, that really is producing what we call a photometric study. It consists of having a 3D model that we're plugging information into, and as it runs those calculations, logarithms, it helps us predict a picture of what the lighting might look like, which helps us make overall decisions in the Luminaire recommendations. She does all her photometric studies, and we look at, okay, this light's gonna cast like this, it's got this kind of spread. Not only are you trying to not put too many lights in, 
and spend too much money, but you're also trying to do it in a way that is comfortable, inviting, but yet special, and not just the same old two by fours and acoustic ceiling. Aiming from 37 volts has been just incredible. Lighting can transform the ordinary into the extraordinary and take an extraordinary space and make it a memorable space. This whole project is about transforming the arcade and creating new memories. Part of that transformation meant going back in time to the original concept. We've taken some buildings that were originally residential and we brought them back to residential. It was interesting, if you look at the size of the spaces that they lived in, they were pretty small, so there was a fair amount of bringing some spaces together to meet local codes and our financing requirements and so on and so forth. But what we had is some great bones, right? And the, the bones always start with the windows. And they have these just spectacular windows that have great arches and they go down to the floor and just you just don't find that anywhere. And, and then, Knowing that the building was a high finish building to begin with, when I say high finish, it wasn't just a warehouse space. It was plastered ceilings and plastered walls and finished floors. The original carpenters on there were from Barney and Smith Car Works. The Barney and Smith Car Works was a Dayton company, a leading builder of luxury rail cars in 19th century America. Their craftsmen were known for their intricate wood carving. A lot of the woodwork was you know, tiger oak, which is quartersawn oak, just nice details, clean, fresh, buildings, fireplaces. Uh, we were able to reincorporate some of that back in. Faux, but aesthetically pleasing. From the very beginning, food has been an important part of the arcade experience, and it will be again. But COVID is casting a long shadow. The virus came like a thief in the night and stole the heart and soul of the restaurant industry. For me personally, it was, it was just terrible for someone to just say, hey, guess what, you're closed now. It, I mean, it's very hard to take. Christian Alvarez and Andy Routson own and operate Crafted and Cured, a completely original Dayton culinary establishment. You have to just be resilient. That's the restaurant industry. If you just sit back and cry in a corner and nothing's working, then you're not going to make it. You have to just pick yourself up do what you got to do, get it going, and try to get the business to survive. And thankfully, we were able to get to this point. Getting to this point meant starting over in the arcade. It's the arcade. I mean, uh, ever since I was a little kid, it's, it's been instilled in me that, you know, the arcade, the arcade, the arcade. My grandparents went there. My parents used to work across the street, and they said they'd go over there all the time for lunch and just Every story you ever hear about the arcade is, is filled with joy. Walking through the space revealed a diamond in the rough. When we first saw it, it was pretty much a blank canvas of concrete, pillars. Our original concept and our original design came from uh, Moda 4. We're working with Becca and Jason. They were very familiar with our brand. The first time they presented a rough sketch, we pretty much looked at it and Said, yeah, that's crafting and cured. You guys did your homework. We did a virtual reality walkthrough, and that really helped us to see elevations and more texture that, that's going on in the space. And that helped us to get the space closer to an end product. Previous location, we were looking at an occupancy of 30, but we're probably looking someplace around the 100 mark with patio, maybe up to 140. So a lot changes with that aspect. Your inventory, your staff, all the way up to the actual workflow process. The previous location was designed to maximize interactions with customers. And that's the biggest challenge with ex expanding the capacity. You want to still keep all those little things that makes Craft & Cure unique, but still being able to handle that volume. While Andy and Christian were working out the details, major transformations were taking place in the hub. What we're doing with the arcade is we're taking 1902 with a 2020 twist. And the 2020 twist is really the way that we've reused space and incorporated new vertical circulation into different parts of the building. 
and one of them was using a slight well between the two buildings, the Rotunda and the Macquarie, and using it not only for vertical circulation, but for natural light distribution. Right? So you're bringing light in from the fourth floor level all the way down to the basement level. But still having those brick walls, those exterior walls, kind of reminds you like this was actually between two buildings. This was not always like this. We have two bridges that kind of flank the north and south side of the, the atrium area. It's how you take a building that one floor doesn't line up with another and you use the bridges to connect floors. The light well, the connection between the Macquarie building and the Rotunda building, that was the the genius of Dave Williams, right? You know, something that I could have never conceptualized, but is almost as dramatic as the rotunda. The light well stair lies at the end of Innovation Hall, a long corridor flanked by glass-walled offices. Just as COVID has affected the restaurant industry, it has also altered the business office landscape. All of a sudden, it changed the whole way we look at our buildings, right? So what, what's the number one thing that's changed during this last year of Zoom and Teams? Is everybody learned that life and the work world could be a little bit more flexible than it was. Therefore, impacts the need for space. What are we selling? Space and place. They completely are kind of buttoned up against each other. But the hub has some inherent advantages compared to traditional office space. The hub is a great alternative because it does a couple things. It provides you your own private office, allows you to be socially distanced. Secondly, it provides you short-term commitments. A typical lease and a commercial deal is five to 10 years. We're talking a one-year commitment with a 60-day out. But yet it also allows you to meet people and be around people that you might not have been able to meet before. So you have a lot of opportunity with huge flexibility in something that's just a way cool modern space and some great old historic fabric. The team was transforming the arcade, but the COVID delays had a cumulative effect. Heading into December 2020, the project was in a precarious position. The pressure was, UD was supposed to move in, technically at the end of the year, and they didn't because the space wasn't done. And there were even bigger issues. All of our funding is based on timelines associated with tax credits. We had to have a, a temporary certificate of occupancy by December 31st, or the project was at risk of losing tax credits. That was you know, a major portion of the funding of the project. The impacts are pretty, uh, pretty severe when it comes to the loss of funds. So it's pretty important. You don't really want to be the person that screws that up. <laughs> Everybody understood how critical it was. August, September, October hit, and you, then you see the amount of work that's in front of you. And then you just really had to put a plan together and you know had to have subcontractor buy-in on that plan to get the job done. And you know, come December 1, you still probably have three months worth of work that has to be completed in one month. And then things got worse. Early December, I started to, you know, chills and uh, body aches. I had COVID. Before I knew it, I was really struggling and had to get in the hospital and I was there two different times on oxygen. Dave Williams going down was a big deal. He's the decision maker, like he's the one that makes those quick, fast decisions. He knows where the money is. He knows all the background. They did what great teams do in a crisis. They came together and got things done. They kind of gave us the reins to get the job done, to push it to the end. It was the team that we had put together with the city of Dayton and their inspectional team. And without their help and support, I'm not sure we would have pulled it off. The model team, Cross Street, Sandvik Architects, Motifora, and the city of Dayton. You know, if everybody wouldn't have come together, that wouldn't have happened. The important lesson to take away is, is how many years have we heard, this will never happen? This will never happen. And here we are, and it's happened. 
So when I look at any of these temporary short-term challenges, I think we've come this far, we can, we can keep going. They won their certificate of temporary occupancy. The funds remained intact. More areas were moving toward completion. One in particular was exceeding expectations. The basement is kind of unique just because who wants to work in a basement is kind of your first thought. So I kind of wanted to play up the fact that you're in a basement by using the darker finishes, but then we lit the space differently than we have anywhere else in the building, kind of like thinking to like almost like a tunnel or subway kind of look, but then bring it up a notch. The basement is probably the most utilized basement in any downtown space, hands down. And it's not like that, it's a way cool space. It's a lot of fun, it has um, some really unique elements. One of the unique elements is called the tank. Before we infilled the floor of the arcade rotunda, we dug it out deeper in the basement level to allow us to create kind of a cool little theater in the round. And that was all designed to sort of parlay with what's happening in the hub. The hub's about innovation, telling the story, bringing in angel investment. It'd be great to have an event space that really spoke and fed that um, opportunity for sharing information and, and uh, getting partners. It's a great presentation space. I can envision putting folks pitching in our pitch event really kind of under the spotlight, so to speak, the hot seat. The tank is a space that I'm sure we will be utilizing quite a bit. Future entrepreneurs will benefit greatly from their UD experience, but that alone won't build a stronger community. There's lots of research and lots of data out there that shows that Black-owned businesses are underrepresented in startup ecosystems. They're underrepresented from a resource standpoint, they're underrepresented from a capital standpoint. The University of Dayton made a commitment to change that. The Greater West Dayton Incubator is a strategic initiative uh, to help support historically underserved and underrepresented entrepreneurs uh, in Greater West Dayton neighborhoods. The Greater West Dayton Incubator has a satellite office in the hub at the Dayton Arcade. At this satellite office location, uh, what we're able to do is provide one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching um, and mentoring and counseling. We're also able to introduce them to the Small Business Development Center, to the Minority Business Assistance Center, uh, all the way to uh, Parallax Research and Launch Dayton. All these entrepreneurial service organizations are centrally located in the hub, and that makes the hub a fantastic resource. One of the incubator's first collaborations will be with Rich Taste Catering, a veteran-owned, minority-owned West Dayton business. Rich Taste will be a food vendor for Startup Grounds, a bistro run by UD students. Together we got started in this business by, um, I gifted him uh, the opportunity to become a caterer. <laughs> and from there, we just kind of grew our business um, by networking and talking to people that were interested in uh, great food. She gifted me um, the catering company through a surprise birthday party. She showed up to the birthday party with chafing dishes and tools and an LLC, a website, a phone number, business cards. So, you know, she gifted me a lot of years of hard work and, <laughs> and blessings. <laughs> I definitely have fun in making any dishes that we make here at Rich Taste Catering. I think the fun is ultimately um, in presenting food that meets the expectation of the customer and you know, bringing a fresh new approach to it. Rich Taste is doing great, um, have a great name, great reputation. And I think when we're talking about supporting Greater West Dayton entrepreneurs, sometimes seeing is believing. Um, and being able to see entrepreneurs that, that look like you have a similar background and story, and you can see the path and the journey that they've taken, uh, have been successful, um, that's really, really critical. Meanwhile, at Crafted and Cured, the dream of building the perfect space was being tested. It's a roller coaster uh, every single day. 
You plan, you plan, you plan, try to get as meticulous as you can down to where the outlet is laid out because the cord is on the left side of a six foot long piece of equipment. Then you come in and realize there's HVAC or plumbing in the way and the outlet can't go there and you've got to redesign the piece of equipment. So it's challenges like that that just come with a building that you, that you can't plan for. These challenges, along with all the other difficulties facing restaurant owners, could be a recipe for insomnia. For me, I don't think it's ever been fear. It's just something that you're, it's, it's what you're doing and it, it is what it is. And the waking up in the middle of the night is usually more of a, what can I, what, what can I do to make sure this is as unique or as, as great as we want it to be instead of worrying about will this work or not? Because if you get into that mentality, it's just, it goes downhill after that pretty quick. <laughs> Whatever challenges the old building presents are outweighed by the prime location and arguably the most iconic and emotive building in the city. It's thrilling. I mean, you get goosebumps. Knowing that you're part of that now um, and bringing new life to a building that's been dormant for 30 years, it's a feeling you really can't put in words until you're in there and um, get to experience the building. And that's the highest priority. Get sections completed, get them open, and get people in. The heavy lifting is over. The work has gotten smaller in scale, but it's no less important. Now, it's all about the details. We've been checking to make sure things are being done according to the design, and then having to come up with solutions when things aren't working out. You gotta know where to sweat them, where to sweat those details and where not to. There's some things that eh, matter and don't matter. And, and so it's just putting your energy in the right spaces and places that give you the best impact for your funds. You have to know what to look for. That comes with experience. He would see stuff and he'd be like, that's, that's not supposed to be like that. And they're not big things, but it's, it's all those little bits and pieces that ultimately everybody doesn't really notice in the same way, but it sets the tone for the whole space. He was the one that would bring it up like in a conference call. From that perspective, because I, I was in there today just checking it out and obviously they uh, did not contain the dust. He'd take you out on site and walk you around and be like, what's this doing, what's that like that? <laughs> There's a list for that. As a section nears completion, issues are noted and a punch list is generated. We create this list and we give it back to the subcontractors and um, they come in and make the repairs. The ultimate goal is to provide a great product that's gonna last and you want ownership happy, you want the, the person that you're working for to be satisfied. January 22nd, 2021, was a cold day in Dayton, Ohio. Before the day was over, the Rotunda Dome would be wearing a crown of brightly colored stars. Over 3,000 pounds of metal and wire, 423,000 lumens of magic. A collaboration between Scenic Solutions and Amy Lawhead. Seeing the lights come on for the first time, it made me think about the history of the arcade, all the memories that had been created there before, and now we had an opportunity for a new lighting design to illuminate new memories. New memories, a first date, a last dance, concerts, exhibitions, weddings and graduations, celebrations of all kinds building the rich fabric of a community. The arcade team faced an unprecedented challenge. They never stopped moving forward. 
The next challenge is getting spaces finished and open and getting leased up. Every day is a step closer. Vince Lewis is giving his new students a glimpse of their future. Every day, more and more people are coming here to work. For the first time in 40 years, people are now calling the arcade their home. And in May 2021, the Contemporary became the first tenant to open their doors to the public. The transformation is happening.